Hello and welcome to Indus News live from Islamabad. I am Muneeb Hamid with the news of this hour. Let's begin with the top stories first. The United Nations has urged for calm as Israeli forces stormed the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound after entering the ceasefire deal. In Gaza, the death toll in Israeli airstrikes has risen to 248, including 66 children. In an interview, Palestine's Foreign Minister Riyad al-Maliki said there are no guarantees the truce will hold. Meanwhile, at a news conference, US President Joe Biden said he was praying that it would last. Nigeria's chief of army staff and 10 other officers, including the crew, have died in a plane crash. The military says the plane was trying to land in bad weather at Kaduna International Airport. Lieutenant General Ibrahim Atahiru only took up his post in January in an overhaul of the army's top brass. Nepal's president, Bithya Devi Bandhari, has dissolved parliament and fixed general elections in November. Both caretaker Prime Minister K.P. Sharma Oli and opposition leader Sher Bahadur failed to form a government by the Friday deadline. The announcement has plunged the country into fresh political turmoil amid a worsening COVID-19 outbreak. India has recorded more than 4,000 deaths from COVID-19 and over 254,000 cases in the past 24 hours. In Pakistan, 88 people have lost their lives, while more than 4,000 tested positive for the virus overnight. Globally, the virus has claimed more than 3.4 million lives and has infected over 165 million people. In golf, Phil Mickelson has a share of the lead at the US PGA Championship as he enters the final two rounds. He fined five birdies in his final nine holes for A3 under 69 on Kiawa Island's ocean course. The 50-year-old sits level with South Africa's Lewis Ostuizen at five under par. These were the top stories. News in detail after a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Now let's have the news in detail. The United Nations has urged for calm as Israeli forces stormed the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound after entering the ceasefire deal. In Gaza, the death toll in Israeli airstrikes has risen to 248, including 66 children. After a fragile truce between Hamas and Israel, thousands of displaced Palestinians in Gaza are returning home. The United Nations has called for food medical and psychosocial support for Palestinians sheltering at the agency's schools. In an interview, Palestine's Foreign Minister Riyad al-Maliki said there are no guarantees the truce will hold. Meanwhile, at a news conference, United States President Joe Biden said he was praying that it would last. He pledged to build a major package with other countries to help rebuild Gaza. And I think that, you know, my party still supports Israel. Let's get something straight here. Until the region says unequivocally they acknowledge the right of Israel to exist as an independent Jewish state, there will be no peace. Saudi Arabia's King Salman bin Abdul Aziz condemned the Israeli aggression in a phone call with Palestine's President Mahmoud Abbas. Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei called on Muslim states to help rebuild Gaza. Despite the ceasefire, tensions are still running high in the West Bank. Israeli colonists attacked several homes and injured many Palestinians in the southern city of Hebron, while Israeli soldiers injured several Palestinians in a clampdown on a protest in Ramallah. Well, now Nigeria's chief of army staff and 10 other officers, including the crew, have died in a plane crash. Lieutenant General Ibrahim Atahiru only took up his post in January in an overhaul of the military's top brass. 
The army says the plane was trying to land in bad weather at Kaduna International Airport. While in a statement, the presidency said Atahiru was on an official visit to Northern State. It was faced security challenges in recent months. Meanwhile, the Air Force says it is investigating the cause of the crash. Now, Nepal's president, Bithya Devi Bandhari, has dissolved parliament and fixed general elections in November. Both caretaker Prime Minister K.P. Sharma Oli and opposition leader Sher Bahadur failed to form a government by the Friday deadline. The presidential order says the first phase of elections will be held on November 12th and the second on November 19th. It said the decision was made on the recommendation of the cabinet headed by caretaker Prime Minister Oli. Oli dissolved the parliament in December, but it was reversed by the Supreme Court in February after weeks of protests. The recent announcement has plunged the country into fresh political turmoil amid a worsening COVID-19 outbreak. Meanwhile, India has recorded nearly 4,200 deaths from COVID-19 and over 257,000 cases in the past 24 hours. While globally the virus has claimed more than 3.4 million lives and infected over 165 million people. More about the pandemic in this report. As India records thousands of deaths daily, families of the victims find it hard to get space and firewood to perform their last rites. In northern state of Uttar Pradesh, there are more than 500 shallow graves along the banks of Ganges. Some of them are suspected to be those who have succumbed to COVID-19. India's crowded financial hub Mumbai is gearing up to get ahead of a potential third wave that experts fear could affect children. To add to the injury, two states have declared rare black fungus an epidemic amid thousands of cases, while the center has made it a notifiable disease. That if you look at the blood reports of patients with COVID-19, the lymphocyte counts in the CBC comes down. And this causes a decrease in their immunity, which predisposes them to fungal infections like mucormycosis. Also, diabetes is a risk factor. As infection levels show early signs of an increase in England, experts warn that the variant of concern first detected in India could grow exponentially in the UK. Germany has committed a further 100 million euros to the COVAX Global Vaccine Initiative. Berlin will also directly donate up to 30 million surplus doses to poorer countries. Meanwhile, the International Monetary Fund has unveiled a $50 billion proposal to end the pandemic. The plan involves vaccinating at least 40% of the population in all countries by the end of 2021 and at least 60% by the first half of 2022. This comes as UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres urged the group of 20 countries to step up. But so far, more than 82% of the world's vaccine doses have, do have gone to affluent countries and just 0.3% have gone to low-income countries. The G20's Rome Declaration is a significant step to provide equal access to vaccines. But we need a follow-up mechanism backed by the political will to translate the declaration into a global vaccination plan. The U.S. has announced to vaccinate 550,000 South Korean service members who work with American forces. Meanwhile, Japan has expanded a state of emergency to add the southern island of Okinawa to its list of the nine prefectures. Meanwhile, Pakistan has recorded 88 more deaths from coronavirus and over 4,000 cases in the past 24 hours. The Health Ministry says the number of fatalities has risen to 20,177. The number of infections has surpassed 897,000, of which nearly 814,000 people have recovered. The Ministry says there are more than 63,000 active cases. Over 4,400 of them are in critical condition. Meanwhile, the inoculation of people aged 30 years and above is set to start from Saturday. The Parliamentary Secretary says local production of the vaccine has begun at the National Institute of Health. Now, Sheen Hamid said, can Sino jabs will be available by the end of this month. Now, moving on in Myanmar's Sagaing region, one of the anti-coup ethnic factions has attacked military positions in the jade mining town of Nkamti. With this move, forces of the Kachin Independence Army has taken new territory. The group's spokesperson confirmed the attack while local media says fighting is still ongoing. It said the targeted site is near a mining venture that involves a military-owned conglomerate. 
Myanmar has been in chaos since the coup, with security forces killing over 800 people during the protest. Earlier, the military-appointed Union Election Commission reportedly said it will dissolve depots Aung San Suu Kyi's political party. Now, U.S. President Joe Biden is willing to meet North Korea's Kim Jong-un if he agrees to discuss his nuclear program. Biden said this after meeting his South Korean counterpart Moon Jae-in in Washington. The U.S. President said his advisers must first meet their North Korean counterparts to lay the groundwork for talks. He said Washington consulted Seoul throughout its Pyongyang policy review. For his part, the South Korean president appreciated what he called the calibrated and practical U.S. approach. Moon also said the two agreed to work together for peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. They also considered special characteristics in relations between China and Taiwan. The U.S. officials say Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin has been unable to speak to China's top general despite multiple attempts. The Pentagon says it wants a dialogue with Beijing, but at a proper level. Officials say it is hard to know if this lack of communication is due to strained ties or China's stubbornness. There was no comment from China's embassy in Washington. Relations between the two are tense with clash over Taiwan, South China Sea and human rights. The UN says embargo violations and delay in the withdrawal of foreign mercenaries threatened hard-worn gains in Libya. In a briefing to the UN Security Council, Special Envoy Jan Kiwis called for a timely withdrawal to address instability. He called on Libyan authorities and institutions to live up to their responsibilities and build on progress made in the past months. Kiwis said the ceasefire continues to hold, but there is no progress on reopening the coastal road between Saad and Misrata. He said further delays could undermine efforts to implement the truce and advance the political transition. He also called on the House of Representatives to clarify the constitutional basis for holding free, fair and secure elections. Ethiopia has for the first time accused troops from Eritrea of killing 110 civilians in the war hit Tigray region in November. The Attorney General's office says Eritrean troops killed 40 civilians during home-to-home -home raids. In a statement, it said the investigation shows that 70 civilians were killed in the city. The office contradicted law enforcement officials who claim a majority of those killed were fighters, not civilians. Ethiopia's military prosecutors have also pressed charges against 28 soldiers suspected of killing civilians in Tigray. Last year, fighting between the federal government and forces in Tigray claimed thousands of lives while displacing more than a million. More news coming up in this news bulletin after a short break. Stay with us. Welcome now. The world's seven richest countries have agreed to stop international financing of coal projects by the end of this year. Environment ministries from the G7 made the announcement after a virtual meeting. The G7 and the EU decided to phase out support for all fossil fuels to meet globally agreed climate crisis targets. In a communique, they said they will work with other partners to accelerate the deployment of zero emission vehicles. They also reiterated their commitment to the 2015 Paris Agreement and the cap to cap the rise in temperatures. Now in China's southwestern Yunnan province, at least three people have died and 28 others injured after a 6.4 magnitude earthquake shook Dali. State media says an emergency has been declared and rescue operations are launched in the city. The China Earthquake Network Center says the quake hit at a depth of 8 kilometers and was followed by aftershocks. Authorities said the collapse of some roads along with landslides cut off transportation lines. Meanwhile, a magnitude 7.3 quake has also struck Qingkai province in western China. However, there were no reports of casualties or damage in the sparsely populated area. Now in Peru, two Antian bears have been spotted at Machu Picchu. 
They called this rare opportunity for sightseeing due to the absence of tourists amid the pandemic. The mother and her cubs strolled through the ruins of this 15th century in Can Citadel near the edge of Peru's southern jungle. The Andean bears, also known as the spectacled bears, are the only bears found in South America. They live in the Andes and the outlying mountain ranges from western Venezuela to Bolivia. The species is classified as vulnerable by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And now let's have a look at how the weather is doing around the world. weather update we come to the end of this news bulletin for the latest updates you can follow us on social media at hinders.news